Well, I'm excited today to uh, kind of break bread with you and really um, share on this next session something that I believe is incredibly important to the growth of all of our churches um, and also in some sense to bring to, to pass um, a group of people in your church or in some sense visited your church and went on that I truly believe that if we grasp this, we can truly make a difference um, in our churches. In Romans chapter 12, verse 7, it says this, speaking of the gifts, it says, if grace gift is serving, and I put volunteer team or your dream team, then thrive in serving others well. If you have the grace gift of teaching, Destiny, we have school of ministry. A lot of you guys got schools of ministry or, or leadership or, or, or school classes. It says then, then be actively teaching and training others. If you have the grace gift of encouragement, small groups, then use it to often encourage others. If you have the grace gift of giving, which are kings, to meet the needs of others, then may you prosper in your generosity without any fanfare. If you have the gift of leadership, discipleship, be passionate about your leadership. And if you have the gift of showing compassion, outreach, then flourish in your cheerful display of compassion. I want to talk to you today about something that is very, that is not talked about a lot in church. And yet, this very part of these gifts will determine how far your church goes. We've been, I've been to conferences after conferences, and they have all these breakout classes. Today, Pastor Jeremy's gonna share with us some secrets on small groups and how to grow them, and volunteers on how to build them, how to assimilate them. We love to do outreach. We love to go into our community talking about values. Our values are love God. We want people to love life. We want people to love people. And we want them to love our city. Whatever the campus is, we want you to love that. We have great discipleship. We just believe that everybody should be discipling someone. And so we emphasize that. We preach on that. And what's amazing about reaching people is that we, in some sense, have created a service on how we're to reach the people we're trying to reach. Like, I've never met a pastor that says, man, I just want a bunch of lights and LED screens just because they're cool. No, I've met a lot of pastors that said, man, I love some lights and some LED screens and different sp some, you know, fog and stuff like that because, man, that may just grab the eye of a person who's far from God and, the only, and it makes them feel like they're welcome because that's what they saw in the club. I... I've seen churches where I've been to where they, they want their people to be filled with the power of God. So, I mean, they're like screaming and, and pounding, and then you come up to the altar, and they slap you, and you go down, and then they tell you to get up, and you go down again. And churches, man, that with churches today that we've created, in some sense, environments where, man, we want people to thrive in, in serving in small groups. See, the atmosphere we create will result in the people we attract. That the atmosphere we create will result in the people we attract. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with attracting broken people. We're called to. There's nothing wrong attracting lost people because we're called to. There's nothing wrong with attracting hurting people because we're called to and yet when we create our environments to just reach lost people and hurting people and broken people they'll serve they'll get plugged into small groups they love to do outreach 
But at the end of the day, the church is missing out on a small group of people that can take your vision further than them. I want to talk to you today about kings. How to attract kings in your church. People think, oh, well, if I attract business people and kings, man, I, I got to change things the, the way we do things. Well, that didn't stop you from changing things that you used to do by wanting to attract lost people or hurting people. Oh, well, you know, I got to water things down. No, no, I don't got to water things down. See, at the end of the day, none of us control the spirit, but we do control the environment. There's a big difference between controlling the spirit and controlling the environment. I like to tell people all the time that, that I'm not a controlling person, but I'm in control. Vast difference. We're not going to have people run around in our church. That ain't going to happen. We're not going to have people screaming real loud, being a distraction. That's not going to happen. They will, we will politely go to them and say, we love your enthusiasm and we love your passion. Okay? But we don't do that here. The same way your kids will yell out in the house will be the same reaction people will get when someone yells in your church. Something's happening. I'm scared. Did something take place? If we're making our environment and our culture conducive to reaching lost people and reaching broken people and reaching hurting people, we must equally make it as conducive of reaching kings. And this is why we have a broke church. And the reason why we have a broke church is because people that can write you a check don't feel comfortable in your place. If you're always just talking about brokenness and you're always talking about hurting and you're always talking about the victim becoming a victor and using all this great language, but you're not focusing your message on how to live successful, on how to live on the other side of the Jordan, because you're still trying to get people across the Jordan, then they don't relate to that. See, the Bible talks about it in Revelation chapter 5. It says, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests. To his God and the Father, to him glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So here's what you have to understand. Every king needs a priest. Every king needs a priest. See, the priests in which you are are assigned to give God-given revelation. That's what a priest does. It gives, it distributes God-given revelation. But a king, their responsibility is that they have been given God-given talent. Imagine having your church filled with revelation but no talent. We're a word church. We preach the word, but nothing gets done. The mission ain't advancing. Man, we got a lot of people getting saved, but we don't got no money to hire staff. Here's what you have to understand. A king without a priest will cast their purpose into poverty. I'm going to say that one more time. A king, a businesswoman, a businessman without a priest will cast their purpose into poverty. They're, they're buying five homes because they got nowhere else to put their money. They're buying all these cars because they don't feel that the church in which they're sitting in is investing well. Here's what you have to understand. To understand kings is to understand the poverty of their purpose. To understand kings, 
You got to understand the poverty of their purpose. Every one of you can tell me about lost people. How are we going to reach them? Every one of you going to tell me how we're going to get people saved. And it's why you are producing those things. But very few can tell me how to reach kings. See, kings have God-given resources to get the vision fulfilled. Kings have God-given resources to get the vision fulfilled. They have it. They have it. And they want to give it. Not only that, but there are so many Josephs of Arimatheus out there that are willing to give Jesus a place they built for themselves. They're willing to sit there and say, I bought this land over here, but guess what? Man, I saw that you see the need and I see all the families that are being saved and the lives are being transformed. Man, I want to give that to this house. It lets me know that if, if, if Joseph of Arimathea was able to have access to Jesus, he was an influential person because he just walked straight into the governor's office and said, I'm taking the body of Jesus, which lets me know he has influence with government, but he also had influence with the disciples. So it lets me know the disciples understood how to reach kings, not just reach broken people, hurting people, but they knew how to reach some kings. And we got to make that as powerful as we do reaching hurt, hurting people, reaching lost people. If everything in your message is about we're reaching lost people, we're reaching hurting people, all oh, the broken, and God's going to get you from here, and oh, he's going to take you up, and he's going to do this, and then the person that's blessed that don't even have them issues. They don't even understand what you're talking about. They can buy anything they want. Can you, you, know, you know the number one thing kings are looking for? Peace. They, they want to go to sleep at night. But they can't go to sleep at night when there's a $60 million deal that's pending. They want peace. What you have to understand is that the gospel is for the broken and for the blessed. And if all you are preaching is a broken gospel, then you are alienating the people that God has assigned to your house to write you the check that's necessary to advance the vision God placed in your life. And let me tell you, this has been a mass cultural shift in our church. I'm talking down to the way we dress. Like, you don't get on my platform if you don't have a blazer on. Because our calling is from heaven. But on earth, pastoring is our profession. Ain't no, but no, no businessman that's handling $100 million, want to introduce his partner, who has $50 million in that, to a pastor on Sunday wearing ripped jeans. It ain't going to happen. It's one thing to be cool, but it's, it's going to chase. It, it, you're going to reach the next generation. It's great, but you better have your iron. You better have your shirt ironed. Come on, you better have a nice stiff, you better have a nice car. You better present yourself well because none of you would step into a meeting to buy a $7 million building with some of the way you guys dress on your platform. You got to ask yourself that question. Is my life presentable? The way I'm dressed, is it presentable? It, or is it attractive to that person? Come on, I know it's going to hurt, but I'm going to help you. Because I talk to so many of you guys and you're just like, man, we got these big dreams and we don't got no money. I'm going to teach you how to get some money. <laughs> Let me tell you what impresses kings. Your heart. is what impresses kings. Your humility. Is what impresses kings. 
and your honor is what impresses kings. They don't really need, they don't really, you can't really sell them on what you have because what you have is very minimal to what they have. Can't go around them and go, oh man, we're, we're going to build a $20 million facility. And they're like, that's just one building I own. You ain't going to win them that way. Your humility does. Your honor does. Your heart does. Every single day, every minute of the day, every text they get is from somebody that wants something from them. And they need to know, they need to know that the only thing you want from them is their heart. I meet with kings on Wednesdays and Fridays. My Wednesday group, which is tomorrow morning, 7 in the morning, that group will do $1 billion of business here in the desert. Some of the most influential people in the desert every Wednesday morning. Every Friday morning, some of the most influential business owners own mega businesses right here in the desert. I've never asked them for one thing. I never allow them to pay for my meal. Matter of fact, I give the, I give the person the card before I walk in. Matter of fact, just two weeks ago, I was at breakfast with one of them, and he walked up to the person and tried to give me his American Express card. And he was like, are you with Pastor? And he was like, yeah. He goes, he beat you. He comes back, you can't do this. And I go, what do you mean I can't do this? Do you mean I can't afford it? Oh, no, no, I know you can afford it, but you can't do this. I said, no, I, I don't have to do this. I want to do this. Because every time you take someone to lunch, you're flipping the bill. Now let me bless you. Just want their heart. We, start off our, we started off when we started our Bible study. I said, I want everyone to grab their hands. They all, I said, lift your hands. Everyone lift your hands. They shook their hands like this. I said, okay, I'm going to put my hand on my heart. You put your hand on your heart. And then I want you to squeeze your heart. And I want you to keep it in your hand. And they kept it in their hand. I said, all right, everybody has their hearts in their hands. I thought, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I got up and I started putting my hand on their heart. Boom. And I slap in their chest. I go, I'm not trying to touch you. I'm just slapping something on you, okay? And here it is. Here's what I'm doing. I'm giving you my heart. I trust you enough to give you my heart. Now I want you to do the same to me. And they all got up and gave me their heart. And by doing that, I said, listen, I didn't ask for your hand. I asked for your heart. Some of us, we want their hands before we want their hearts. And they ain't going to give you what's in their hands until you can grab their hearts. What attracts kings? What attracts kings is an entrepreneurial leader. I like to call him a pastorpreneur. Somebody who can preach, somebody who can lead, but at the end of the day, understands their world. Understands it. Another thing that attracts kings is this, someone that wants something for them rather than from them. I, I, want, I, I want it all for you. This is going to be all about you. Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to help you. Whatever you need, I'm going to help you. What attracts kings to you is someone who adds value to their life. What type of value are you adding to their life? They have everything. But they're missing what you have. Everything they live for is for the here and the now. Everything they work for is for now and there. And so all they can think about, they wake up in the morning. What grounds are we taking? Where are we going? What deals are we going to make? 
what's pending right now. That's all they think about. And then on Wednesday morning when I show up, we never talk about the here and now, the now and there. I place their thinking on something that is extremely bigger than that. And it's called eternity. We're going to get eternally focused. We're going to focus on making an eternal difference. In other words, here on earth, man, you're taking all this territory, man. You're buying all these buildings, man. You, no, no, no. It's all great. But what's bigger than that is making an eternal focus. When they start to think about the condition of their soul, they start thinking about the condition of their heart. They start thinking about, man, I'm going to live longer there than I'm going to live here. And here's, and here's the difference. They are great here, but we are great there. And so I'm not trying to go in there and convince them that I got a lot of vision like them, that I got a lot of, a lot of business skills like them, because I'll lose every time. At the end of the day, when I walk in, they have something that most people want. But the reason why they show up every week is because they, have some, they want something that I got. I got peace in the morning. I love my wife. My kids are being raised up in godly ways. Listen, I can sleep at night. And they're attracted to that. And that's not what you're doing on earth. It's making an eternal impact. Man, everything I think about every day is souls. Every day I think, I think about their ch Man, we were in Joshua chapter uh, 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 15. L last week we are going through the book of Joshua. And we were in the book of jo Joshua chapter 15, verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. And, 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 and it was when, 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 when Caleb's daughter went up to Joshua and says, you know, you owe, you owe, you, you know I got to get my portion. And Caleb gave the portion to his daughter. And when, when it was time for me to pray, I prayed for all their children. The eyes got watery. And I said, you will be successful daddies. Your children will grow up and love you and your wife and love God. And I'm weeping in that room, in a boardroom. The presence of God is there. How many of their employees ever walk up and say, man, I, I want the best for your children? Nobody does it. Only those who have an eternal focus on something bigger than what they're going on today. Doors that... Lisette and I have been knocking on and like standing in front like little poor little pastors. Let us in. We want to get into this world. We want to influence it. These guys have keys to it. Come on. We going. Come on, I'm going to take you. I'm going to introduce you. to No, no. And every time they take us around their friends, every one of them says, they can never stop talking about you guys. They never talk. They, I've heard so much. I've heard so much about what, how you're impacting his life. I was golfing this past week with a friend of mine, and we were golfing at this, this, this um, golf course exclusive. And I was, I, I had forgotten some balls, so I had to go up back to my car. So I go up to my car, and then I, I grab the balls, and I come down. One of the guys in my life group who, who lives there, his wife was coming out of the gym, just finished up yoga. And I walked up to her, and I said, hey. And I gave her a hug. And she goes, oh, I'm sweaty. I go, no, it's okay. And, 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 she, and I said, uh, man, your husband called me yesterday out of town. And he was, he was ecstatic that he got that contract. Finally, he was able to hire that guy. She goes, I know. And I said, man, we, I, said, I said, hey, man, let's just stop right now. We're going to do a praise break. And she's like, what's a praise break? I said, I know he asked me that too. 
I said, it means we stop where we're at and we're just going to give God praise. And he was like, okay, pastor, I'm going to stop and I'm going to give God praise, but I just want you to know I got two cocktails in my hands. <laughs> Come on, how many know you got to love that? <laughs> and he said, and we praised God, praised God for the person he hired, and she looked at me and her eyes got watery. She says, I just want you to know that my husband and I love you and your wife. We love what you got. Watch this. Whatever you need, whatever you need, you can count on us. I gave her a big hug. I said, thank you so much. Thank you for letting us golf at your golf. This is a treat. This is amazing. Thank you so much. She begins to walk away. She turns around. She goes, oh, oh, by the way, I know the project that you guys are working on. I said, yeah. She goes, you can count on us. Touched an area in her life. Touched an area in their lives. Nobody else is touching. I don't need anything from your hand. I just need your heart. It's all I need. We make an eternal difference. Not only that, we help them with their family. When we get involved, man, every, every, how's your kids doing? How's your son doing? Doing good? I write it on my calendar. Hey, I better text him this week. Son, I text him, hey, your son's having a test this week? So I want to let you know this morning I was praying for him. They write back, thank you so much. Man, Lord, Jesus, you help them with their family. And then also you infuse in them that the church is the place that meets the needs for everyone. Like where else can you go? And at the same time, every person in your family is being touched. Every person in your family is being blessed. And you begin to teach them that it's not their business. It's the church that's going to change the world. And all of a sudden, they start buying into it. Man, I got somewhere I can invest. See, the key to working with wealthy people is to make them rich where they're poor. The key to working with wealthy people is, is, is to make them rich where they're poor. Every single person has wealth and poverty at the same time. Every person does. So how do I add to where they're poor? It's simple. You add to their legacy, you, you, someone who can add legacy to their prosperity. Like in other words, listen, you're no longer living for yourself. You're living for the next generation, the generation. You're living for something that will outlive you. I want to help you with your legacy because your legacy is not just your business and it's just not your family. Your legacy has to be the place that's been feeding you and your family that has the ability to feed other people as well. They need to know that what you have is more than what they need, more than, more than what you need they have. You need to know what you have is more than what they have. It's so easy to get intimidated by wealthy people. The cars they drive, the places they shop. It was hilarious. A few weeks ago, I come into one of my studies, and they're talking about vacations. And they're like, oh, yeah, man, we're going to take the plane, and we're going to go here. And we're using this travel agency, and they get you all behind the scenes. And you stay at these exclusive resorts, man. And, then, you know, you can't even get in these places. It's going to be incredible, man. We're, you know, we're going to have a great fun. It's going to be fun. And they look at me, and they're like, have you ever heard of that? And I looked at them. I said, brother, I, I, I'll order everything from Expedia. Be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. Oh, like, no, heaven waits. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I, yay. Um, by the way, like, what I make in a year is probably like a week of your commission. 
And they're like, and I'm like, ha, laugh on that one. And they're like, yeah. I said, but but I enjoy it. You know, I I I I I love flying coach, taking an Uber. I'm good with that. But what I have is far greater than what you have. It's why I'm gone. And I'll be like, I can't be here this Wednesday, I can't be here this Friday. And I'll text them, let's just, oh, no, 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 we, we ain't missing a week. And I told my wife this a few weeks ago. I said, it's amazing that these people will not miss a week. But they have no conviction missing a Sunday. What are they getting? I'm going to talk about it. Because at the end of the day, you're never going to win a king's heart from the stage. Never. Never. And if they've given you something, it's probably a tip. Just so that they can get your attention. You know, another thing kings love is they, they love when you give them a front row seat to the miracles of God. You don't think I've had my photographer take a picture of this already? And I've already sent it to all my kings. Thank you so much for investing in us. Thank you for allowing me to do what I do. Saturday morning, I went and spoke to 100 leaders in, in Lafayette. I took a picture. And I said, pray for me. Guys that wouldn't even know how to pray. Now, like, we're praying for you, Pastor. They get in your heart. They see what you're influencing. They see what you're doing. They see you're making a difference. See, another thing about kings is what you have to understand is that someone whose vision is bigger than theirs. I promise you every day they don't get around people whose vision is bigger than theirs. Not at all. No way. Oh, no, 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 no. What we got and what we're doing, the money we're making, the companies we're building, you ain't never going to get in front of them. No one's going to get in front of them and, and cast a vision that's going to be bigger than theirs except you. Except you. Because at the end of the day, their vision is as big as what earth can produce. Your vision has nothing to do with earth. It has everything to do with eternity. Come on. Earth is just the place that God uses because our ultimate home is not here. We're taking people somewhere. Hey, we may be assimilating them from here to there, but at the end of the day, that there is to get them closer to there because the day is coming that our Lord and Jesus Christ, the sound of the trumpet will go and the church that is in Christ will be caught up for such a time as this. We are getting them eternally focused. So I never speak about, hey, this is what we're doing at Destiny. Now, that's small to what they deal with all the time. But I always sit there and I always start, before I go, I always say, let me tell you about some eternal impacts we had this week. 19 people in one service gave their heart to Jesus. Man, we had 156 people across our campuses a month ago that got baptized. And they're sitting there and they're like, wow. Because at the end of the day, that vision is bigger than theirs. You're not going to win them on what size of building you want to buy. You're not going to win them on how many people you're, you're not going to win them on that. What you're going to win them on is something that doesn't even happen here. It happens up there. And every day people are getting saved. You got to give them a front row seat to the miracles God's doing. Every week, one of my guys asks me, how many people got saved this week? I'm like, oh, yeah. Are you ready? You really ready? How you get kings to respond to you 
is do you believe this is for eternal cause? See, let me help you out here. They don't care what you drive because they probably drive something better. They really don't care where you live because they probably live somewhere better. They really don't care what you have because it's just a small fraction of what they have. What they care about is what are you doing to change lives that I can't do? I can't do that, but you can. They're gifted to make money. We're gifted to reach people. And they have to work together. You often got to let them know, do you want your stock in heaven to be more than your stock on earth? Because you're building a lot of wealth on earth. But are you going to be wealthy in the kingdom? A few weeks ago, I shared with them. I said, I said man, as I close, I, I want to share something with you guys. I said, I know all y'all live in nice homes. Drive the nicest cars. You guys, is, you guys are balling out. I said, it's going to be interesting who has the biggest houses on earth compared to those who have the biggest houses in eternity. It's going to be amazing how much bling you got here. But it's going to people you never knew they're going to have a lot of bling up there. And when you start to point them to something that's bigger, that's going to live longer, that is a better investment, all they want to know is if what I'm giving you, can you steward it the right way? I love what a few weeks ago I was speaking on poverty and wealth. We're in the book of James and going book by book, chapter by chapter, and I said this, I said, um, and you don't have to say it out loud, I'm just going to ask you a question. And The question I asked was, was Jesus rich or was he poor? Was Jesus rich or was he poor? The answer is that he was both. Paul describes it in Corinthians. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor. So that those who are in poverty will become rich. So he who was rich became poor. For those who were poor will become rich. Let me say it like this. Those who were at the top came to the bottom. So those who are on the bottom can come to the top. And so every time Jesus is referring to money, he's never talking about your economic status. Matter of fact, the currency we have today was different than the currency they had back then. Because at the end of the day, it's not about being rich or poor. It's about being godly or ungodly. For instance, godly rich, Abraham, Job, Joseph, ungodly rich, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar. What about, what about godly poor? The widow's might, ungodly poor, lazy people in Proverbs, and those who rob God from the tithe. See, there's a big difference between your net worth and your self-worth. Big difference. Your net worth has everything to do economically. It's what, it's, it, it's what kings live for. They live for that. 
But your self-worth is socially, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And this is why. This is why a king needs a priest. Here's why. Because the priest doesn't speak to them economically. The priest speaks to them socially, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Because if we can get them emotional stable, if we can get them, watch it, we can get them mentally stable, if we can get them to a place, watch this, if we get to the place where they are spiritually stable, then guess what? Their success is not going to be their demise. But if there's no priest in their life, socially, they begin to lose it. Mentally, they begin to lose it. Emotionally, they start having affairs and addictions. And then it affects them economically. They need to know that you care about their, their mind, their heart, their family. Because at the end of the day, they will give you whatever you need because they have it. They have it. Here are two prayers I pray every day. Every day. God, Give us the relationships and the resources to go with the responsibility you've given us. Give us the relationships. We need them. Give us the resources to go with the responsibility you've given us every day. And now here's the next prayer I pray, and I want you to get this. God, Please give us the gold, the fish with the gold corn in their mouths. I want you to see this. Watch this. It's the only time in scripture that a disciple went out fishing without a net. They went with a hook. What are you saying? You cannot reach kings by the same tools you use to reach masses. You cannot sweep it across your congregation. Out of all the millions of fish that were in that ocean, God had one assigned to Peter. And Peter had to walk up there and had to literally hand pick it from the masses and open up its mouth and the coin was inside that fish. If you don't walk up to a king and say, I want to disciple you, they ain't going to come walking to you. You can't use the tools on Sunday and think they're just going to sign up. Because at the end of the day, they're in front of masses all the time. They want to be individually picked. They want, they, they, they want to be in a room where it's safe. It's not about the size of that group. Matter of fact, one of the rules I got in these groups is I don't bring anybody to them. I let them bring someone else. Because at the end of the day, whoever they're going to recommend is at their level and can be trusted. I never want to bring in somebody that they think I'm bringing in that behind the scenes may have a motive. They're too sacred for me to protect. I spend two days, two mornings a week with kings. I will do it the rest of my life. Because at the end of the day, they have what I need. And I have what they need. And so with the same emphasis, you're doing to tailor your services to create more dream teamers. Create more students. Create more small groups. Do more outreach. Don't forget that one group that's in the middle of those gifts. The gifts of giving. 
Because if you alienate that group, you will not have the resources to advance. And I close with this. I remember I was on the board of a very popular church with a very popular conference. And at that time, that conference was the hottest thing in America in Dallas. And I remember the leader going up there, and there was 4,000 pastors. It was sold out. It was the most unreal conference. Everybody flew into Dallas for that conference. And he went up there and he said this. He says, you'll always have more vision than provision. You'll always have that. And I remember people clapping and people were like, wow, yes, God. I was a, I was a consultant at that time. I haven't even started church planning. And then when I planted the church, I bought into that lie. You'll always have more vision than provision. Let me, let me just stop there for a moment. You will have more vision than God's provision. Just, just, just think about that statement because that is a slap to God's face. Let me just stop you right there. So then I searched because I'm a searcher. And I went back to the first time God asked someone to build him a temple and a tabernacle. And his name was Moses. And in the Bible, they call it the law first mention. If it's mentioned the first time, that's God's original will. Man, he had so many business people, so many kings, that he had to tell them, hey, guys, we got too much. We got more than what we can. We don't even need that. Let's, let's send them back. You want to know what God's will is? That you have more provision than you have vision for your life. That's God's will for your life. But it wasn't ordinary people that brought the gold and the silver. It was the kings. It was the business people in those days. Because he paid attention to a group of people that today the church is neglecting. Yes, let's reach lost people. Yes, let's reach broken people. Yes, let's reach hurting people. But my God, let us reach blessed people as well. They need the gospel just like broken people, just like hurting people. They need a Jesus that you're giving to them because they need it just as much. And don't apologize. Man, we're reaching these people. Don't apologize. And lastly, I was, I was in Lafayette this last weekend. It, it was a, it was the greatest weekend that me personally I've ever experienced in my life, in my life. I'm so thankful I got a, a phenomenal pastor who's willing to invest in my life. And what he did was something that almost left us in a daze. Instead of us, a few guys coming in and him speaking, he brought in kings, and they began to tell us their story. And one guy was like, I came to our saviors. I was pocket rich, which means all the money I had was in my pocket. I would live in a trailer. I remember asking a guy for a little corner piece of the lot, if I could just put 10 cars on there, I'll sell them. And all of a sudden, watch this. Watch the trend. All of a sudden, Pastor Jacob walks up to me. He says, young man, I see something in your life. I want to personally disciple you. We meet on this day. And so they meet. And he says, I started giving Pastor the permission to speak into the areas of my life I've never given anyone else. He goes, this year my business will do 700 million. And every year it's a privilege, it's a privilege to give $2 million to our church over and above my tithe and my offer. It's a privilege to do that. 
Next guy walks in. I was Baptist. I didn't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I own the largest tire business in all of the state of Louisiana. And I got cancer, stage four. I went to my Baptist pastor and I said, would you pray for me? And he says, yeah, we'll pray God's will. You should start getting all your stuff lined up because you probably, you're going to eternity. Well, he wasn't ready to die. Heard about this church. Now, just pray for the sick. Ain't weird, just, just pray for the sick. So he came, started attending. Pastor Jacob saw him. Hey, man, I do a Bible study on Wednesday. Listen, let me go after the fish with the gold coin in their mouth. I can't sweep it. I got to grab it. Brought him to his group for a year and a half every night on the phone before he goes to bed. You shall live and shall not die and declare the works of the Lord. Go to bed that night. He's about to go to bed the next night. Pastor Jacob will come. Man of God, you will live and you will not die so you can declare the works of the Lord. For 18 months, cancer started shriveling, shriveling. Shriveling, 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 shriveling. Man of God, we, we got this building over here. Eight million dollars. They just want three million for it. Help me pray so I go before the church. Believe God we're going to raise it. The man in his Bible study raised his head, Pastor, you ain't going to the church. There's no need to go to the church. I'm going to drive you over to my accountant's office, and we're going to write the church a $3 million check. Because the last 18 months, you've been calling me every night, declaring the word of the Lord over my life. You've had me in a Bible study. I've been saved all my life. But the last 18 months, I've learned more about God and more about his kingdom and more about things that I've ever could do. i got a reason for my purpose and my prosperity now. I can sow and make dreams a possibility in Jesus' name. Then we go to lunch. And at lunch... There's three other kings waiting for us. One guy, he said, I went to seminary. I graduated, went into ministry, and got hurt, broken. Didn't want nothing to do with ministry no more. Three years later, I walk into our Savior's church. I see a friend of mine that I used to party with. And God knows that if he didn't greet me, I probably would have never came back. My friend who happened to be in that little small Bible study. Come on, you're, you're, you're starting to see the trend. This little small Bible study invited me to come. Pastor Jacob started noticing the hurts in my life. Started speaking to it, speaking to it, speaking to it. One day there in the Bible study. And then Pastor Jacob starts talking about homes. God's going to build, build a house. House, 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 house. Came to his thighs. Wrote it down. Two weeks later, he says, I'm going to, um, Pastor Jacob speaking. He's talking about the river of God, that God's stirring the gifts inside of you, and the river of God begins to flow. He wrote down the word river. A month later, he starts, they're in the Bible study. Pastor talks about going hunting on this ranch. Wrote down the word ranch. Houses, river, ranch. Joseph knows. It's the most prestigious area in Lafayette. And the guy sitting in front of us who got hurt by a church, went to seminary, built the majority of the homes in there. Today, what do you do? All help men who are hurt by church. I have my own group. Oh, and by the way, I'm one of the kings. 
I give a million dollars. God gives it to me. So I bless his kingdom. And let me just say this. They just don't give to their church. Some of these people have given millions of dollars to other churches. That they have asked their pastor, who do you want us to sow into that you believe? Some of us guys are there and we're going, private Bible study equals public provision. Jesus did it. Private studies, go into the room, shut the door, this kind of power, only comes through prayer and fasting, equates to public victories. Pastors, let me speak to you for a second. The greatest investment you'll ever do privately is build your kings. Pastor Obed, I don't have them. Make them. They have dreams. Make them. Because at the end of the day, you'll never have to beg. They'll just want to deliver it to you. Because when you get their hearts, you'll always get their hands. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for all these pastors here today. Lord, I thank you that you have assigned kings to us. Lord, there's people of influence in government, politics, entertainment, business, education. Lord, you've assigned them to our houses. Let us never forget that that is a gift that you've given to the church. We love the gift of encouragement for small groups. We, we love the gift of outreach for reaching people outside our doors. We love the gift of teaching for school of ministry. Lord, we love the gift of leadership, discipleship. But Lord, help us to gain a greater revelation for the gift of giving. That God, we will have an environment that is safe for kings help us to invest with the fish with the gold coin in their mouths Lord they're waiting for the right hands to open up in front of them I bless every church I bless every provision in Jesus name that we will lack no good thing in Jesus name and all God's people